Welcome to Season 3, Episode 5, Chronicles of UK Salafism and Insider Perspective. This particular episode shall review the year 2014. And I will begin with the trial of Jamie Pauline Ramirez, sister Sumaya, who I represented as an expert witness for the defence. Her trial took place on the 6th of January 2014, and she was sentenced to eight years imprisonment. During the trial, I provided my expert evidence in which I had assessed her cognitive development, and my conclusion was that she was vulnerable, gullible, and it was upon this premise as a new Muslim that she travelled to Ireland to meet her future husband, who was considered the ringleader of this particular group that wanted to travel to Europe and assassinate Lars Vilks, the Swedish cartoonist. Now, the conditions of her sentencing were such that she would be placed in a prison near Leadville, Colorado, and that she would receive mental health treatment. I want to refer to the letter that I received later that evening following the trial. I did a Skype appearance and the judge questioned me, as did um, the defence for Jamie uh, Sumeya and the prosecution. And in in connection with that, the email that I got that evening from Jeremy Gonzalez Ibrahim, um, Jamie's lawyer, went as follows. Hello, Abdul. Attached is the judgment. The judge credited your testimony. Judge Tucker understood that you were discussing Walid's understanding, that's Jamie's son, of what was transpiring and that what Jamie was doing was not indoctrination, close quote. So Walid was her son, as I've mentioned, and he was enacting um, being a warrior, a mujahid, in a video. And this was seen as and considered incriminating evidence against Jamie in her trial. Continuing with the email. Quote, the concern Judge Tucker expressed was that in leaving Colorado and bringing her son, at that juncture of decision making, Jamie was intent on supporting Ali in his training for jihad, this is the crime, yet still exposed her son to an unknown. Close quote. Ali was um, none other than Ali Sharaf, the main ringleader who has since been extradited to the US to face um, trial. And reading further into this email, we see that um, Jamie's sentence was capped at 180 months, 50, 15 years because of guidelines and because of her cooperation. Before that, it was that she would be sentenced to a minimum of 30 years to life. Therefore, considering the circumstances in her receiving eight years sentence was light in contrast to the maximum cap of 15 years that she could have received and the life sentence she could have received if she had not cooperated. I'll complete the email now, quoting the final observations of her lawyer. Quote, What was clear is that the judge and government were comfortable that Jamie was not radicalised nor any longer vulnerable to be radicalised. Close quote. The success of reducing her sentence due to the um, expert evidence that had been submitted in her defence is something that should be acknowledged by statutory agencies and by Salafi communities themselves because I believe that practitioners within those communities have a role to play due to our ideological knowledge and experience in combating extremism and it's important that that vacuum is filled by the right expertise unlike what we're seeing now with experts or professed experts with little or no experience other than theoretical knowledge from secondary sources, um, which is problematic and continues to obscure and skewer successful defences and understandings of what radicalisation looks like and how to counter it. And I also want to make an important point here in that Jamie Paul and Ramirez's case 
could be used as a case study and as a precedent for potentially returning these young women who went and became wives for the so-called Islamic State in Syria. And Shamima Begum's case comes to mind in her requesting and desiring to be returned to the UK. We also only have to look at the wider problem that other Western countries are facing in returning their citizens and how to deal with them. And Jamie Paul and Ramirez's case, Sumeya's case, I think is a template that can be used and adjusted to fit the current challenges of bringing back these young ladies. One key lesson that can be learned from Jamie's case was the involvement with her prior to her return to the US and her subsequent trial, because it enabled me to understand her cognitive development and also challenge any notions and beliefs that were contrary to mainstream Islam. And where she needed disengagement to go through that process with her while challenging, as I've mentioned, those narratives. And this was important because the challenge that faces governments now is that if they're going to bring back these women and their children from Syria, from the camps they are being detained in at present, they have no knowledge or no opportunity to gauge where they are as they return. And it would have been an opportune occasion to send in those with expertise to start engaging while they're being detained in a different and foreign environment and engage with them as they proceed towards returning to their home countries and facing the criminal justice system in those respective countries. I want to move on to the 7th of May now and another significant event took place in the US and that was Abu Hamza al-Misri's trial. And I want to read from a newspaper article from The Telegraph which highlights some factors that are quite significant around his trial. And one of those was Abu Hamza revealing that he was working secretly with the MI5 and the police. The article reads, quote, Abu Hamza, the radical Islamic preacher, notorious for his hate-filled sermons, was in reality working secretly with British intelligence to, quote, keep the streets of London safe by cooling hotheads, his lawyer claimed in a US court. Holding up what he said were reports from Scotland Yard, from Scotland Yard, Joshua Drattel described the cleric as an intermediary who cooperated with MI5 and the police to try and end the foreign hostage takings and diffuse tensions with the Muslim community in Britain. The extraordinary admission will fuel conspiracy theories that he was allowed to preach hatred without arrest for so long in the UK because he was working with the security authorities. Mr Dretel, the lead defence attorney, made the startling claim as Hamza prepared to take the witness box in his own defence in his New York trial where he has pleaded not guilty to 11 charges of terrorism. During his trial in the UK in 2006, Hamza claimed he was a regu in regular discussions with MI5 and Special Branch between 1997 and 2000. He claimed then that he was told he could continue to preach as long as we don't see blood on the street. Close quote. Now, I want to focus on this point from a personal perspective in that slanderous allegations continued to proliferate amongst various quarters of the Muslim community from Abu Hamza and from colleagues who espoused extremist rhetoric like him, Abdullah al Faisal being another. Yet, all the while, evidence was there and he was aware that it was in fact him working with the authorities, spying reporting to the intelligence services. 
And this has happened on a few other occasions. And we see that an individual who wrote his own book, sensationalist book at that, Morton Storm, also spied and decided to spy among the Muslim communities in the UK and elsewhere. And in Morton Storm's book, he even talks about a meeting or seeing Abu Hamza and there was some type of exchange, tacit exchange, and that confirmed for him that Abu Hamza was working for the intelligence services and a spy in that instance. An important observation should be made at this point, and that's in connection with the silence that reverberated around extremist circles at the revelation of Abu Hamza's informant activity. And this is something that is peculiar to extremists as well as cults in that when one of their figureheads or a member of their organisation or belief system is revealed to be doing that which they've accused others of throughout the 90s and the noughties, they remain silent. The many accusations that emanated from Abu Hamza against Salafis myself in particular, of being spies, was in actuality a smokescreen for his own activities of cooperating and working secretly with the MI5 and the police. And continuing with that article, because more needs to be elaborated upon regarding the extent of this cooperation, quoting from the Telegraph article again, quote, but Mr. Dratel contended that his client was in fact just making those outrageous statements to appeal to parts of the Muslim community. That was in connection with the 9-11 attacks, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Continuing, quote, he's going to testify that he took a certain position publicly for a certain reason, but at the same time his intention was to de-escalate, to avoid wider war and to keep the streets of London safe. Mr. Dratel told Judge Catherine Forrest in deliberations before the jury was ushered into the federal courtroom. He said that Hamza expressed his true intent in discussions with Scotland Yard and MI5. Quote from the lawyer, it goes to the theme of our defence that he was an intermediary, that MI5 asked him on multiple times to act in hostage situations, cool down the community and maintain a sense of order, close quote, he argued. Mr. Dratel said he was working from 50 pages of reports of Scotland Yard, quote, their notes of what was said, close quote, from him in dealings with Hamza between May 1997 and August 2000, the period covered by US charges against him. Quoting from the lawyer again, the documents were provided by the UK, close quote, he said. They touch on virtually every conflict that we are talking about in this case, Algeria, Bosnia, Yemen, Afghanistan, close quote from the lawyer, but continuing with the article. The fact that Hamza was able to preach publicly in Britain for so long before he was apprehended fueled rumours that he was in some way being protected by the police or security services, but there was never any confirmation of this. Mr. Dratel cited specific cases in which he said that the British authorities turned to Hamza for his assistance. After arrests were made in Britain related to the civil war in Algeria, Hamza was asked how the community is reacting and how to keep the community in equilibrium. He agreed to do so and made proposals. On another occasion, when a British captive was taken in Kashmir, Hamza was reportedly asked to try to intervene as he had connections with the hostage-taking group from his time in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Mr. Dratel said his client made some phone calls but was unable to help. And the lawyer said that after two suspects in the 1998 US Embassy bombings in East Africa were subsequently arrested in Britain, there was a discussion between Hamza and the authorities about cooling the hotheads. So I'll end that article citation here and highlight yet again that while Abu Hamza was putting up these smoke screens and accusing Salafis of being informers in the pockets of the intelligence services. And remember from previous episodes, I'd mentioned the former accusation was that Salafis were in the pockets of the Saudi regime. 
So all of these accusations as smoke screens basically hid his activity and what he was doing with the authorities. And this is an important observation to make. Hence me elaborating upon it at this particular stage because subsequent revelations came out about other extremist sympathizers who had either taken money from the uh, police or intelligence services or were providing intelligence concerning individuals traveling to Syria more recently. And in concluding on this aspect of this episode around the Abu Hamza trial and case, he was to be sentenced to life imprisonment in January 2015 and the charges included hostage taking, plotting to set up terrorist training camps in the US and the assistant attorney general said about him, Abu Hamza is an unrepentant all-purpose terrorist. Salafis were and continue to be active in combating extremism and we only have to look at the success in the 90s before the authorities even caught up to what we were doing with our own community activities, our own local activities in warning our, our members about them. That Abdullah al-Faisal, Omar Bakri, Abu Hamza al-Misri, Abu Qatada al-Filistini, they were all refuted during the, the 90s and the noughties. Their second tier of followers who emerged like Anjum Chowdhury, was subsequently refuted. And we saw a shift from them, an outward shift, in which they saw the, the challenging and the confronting of their narrative was so effective that they tried to then claim to be Salafis and espouse Salafia. And that continued right up to um, the formation of so-called Islamic State with Daesh and individuals going out and, and, and claiming to be Salafis, whereas their methodology was far from what Salafism espouses. To date, no other religious entity within the UK and abroad continues to have the success and effectiveness at combating extremism like the Salafi movement. And this is something governments should take into consideration in view of their failure to thwart the threat of violent radicalization in their societies. I will move to further along in that month, the 26th of May, and refer to a more local um, climate. And I wrote an email to other Salafi community leaders and activists regarding the prevent strategy as it had changed um, from Prevent Mark 1, as I, I term it, and Prevent Mark 2 was fully underway. And I want to provide an insight of that advice to these colleagues and why that advice was given. So my email of the 26th of May was to a number of individuals around the country, um, including Luton, and I stated, quote, Cooperation with the police under Prevent is not something I'd advise now especially under this government. Under the previous government, when they approached my organisation's street to apply for funds due to the effectiveness of our work, I made my terms unequivocally clear, namely that our work was to equip young men religiously and socially to develop and participate in society. Under the Channel Project, which was new at the time, we actually stipulated the parameters within which we were prepared to work. That was not providing detail that was not providing details of individuals who came through our doors, nor data of their activities, gang-related or otherwise. Continuing with my email, I stated, The government was initially very uncomfortable with this, but saw I wouldn't budge from this position. I explained that I was providing a parallel service. 1. Empowering and educating hard-to-reach youth, who they were afraid or unable to approach. And 2. In view of this, we were stepping in and providing a service that was supposed to be done by the social and youth services. As they had failed in these respects, it wasn't unusual that we continue to operate on our terms. Unfortunately, some communities allowed themselves to be manipulated and dictated to by the authorities, especially the police, 
who were uncomfortable with not being able to control intelligence and data with informants. Other communities and groups emerged that were prepared to cozy up to the authorities for fame and fortune. Quilliam Foundation comes to mind. The revisions to the Channel Project under this government basically gave the police what they wanted. Communities to provide them with intelligence, the top-down informant relationship, which unsurprisingly still attracted some groups who were intent on labelling almost every Muslim group, including Tabliki Jama'a, as violent takfiri radicals or extremists. Streets funding was cut due to A, us being Salafi, and B, me refusing to play ball under the new government and channel project. Refer to Cameron's Munich speech and ask yourself who he was directing this towards and then look at the papers the following week in which Street was the first organisation named and inferred to be non-violent extremists. To reiterate, any previous cooperation or partnership with the authorities under Prevent was done largely on our terms. If you are not able to establish these and are browbeaten or coerced to cooperate or operate in a way that suits the police, then refuse or desist irrespective of the consequences. I won't go into details of some of the tactics deployed against me personally for a number of years, even when it was clear that I always fought extremism. This preceded and succeeded my work with Street in parallel to various statutory authorities. If you cannot get partnership where you can disagree and walk away, then avoid any type of relationship because it will be one-sided against you. One further bit of advice. If you do work in a partnership type relationship, do it under the auspices of an independent, not-for-profit company or charity, and not a masjid or community-based center, because you stand to compromise that entire community if and when things get a bit sensitive or go wrong. A separate organization protects the communities you come from and gives you more autonomy and clout to stand up to what can become an unequal partner if they decide to try and force you down a road you are reluctant to go down. I've written a chapter on this in a book on counter-radicalisation, as well as in my PhD, which was converted into a subsequent publication, if you want to read more about how I dealt with this issue, inshallah, close quote. So that was my communication to fellow Salafi um, colleagues about Prevent. And again, this is being mentioned because no distinction was made by later um, advocacy groups criticising Prevent between Mark 1 and Mark 2. And Prevent Mark 2 is definitely a worse phase of this strategy, which Muslim communities and practitioners should not engage with at all. I've mentioned that before, so I won't go over my observations and concerns regarding that again. I'll move to June 2014 now and focus on the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS. That name was what was chosen the previous year, 2013. But in June of 2014, they launched an offensive on Mosul and Tikrit. And by the 29th of that month, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi emerged and announced the formation of a caliphate stretching from Aleppo, Syria to Diyala, Iraq, and renamed the group so-called Islamic State, with him being the... Um, caliph. Now, we still have the taste and remnants of Daesh, as they've been called now, um, and the threats of their re-emergence in Syria. But at their peak, we saw that they held approximately one third of Syria and 40% of Iraq. Such was the devastating effect of this extremist entity. At this point, I will reflect on al-Baghdadi's detainment alongside others who would emerge to form this so-called Islamic State in Camp Bukha. And Professor Anne Spackard's book, Talking to Terrorists, details this um, quite articulately. She was one of those who had been consulted to participate in implementing a de-radicalization program in Camp Bukha. And in a chapter entitled by the same name, she goes into and describes the, the conflict and challenges that were taking place amongst the team tasked with delivering this de-radicalisation programme. The programme itself was developed by another prevent organisation in the UK that had got consent 
to work with Anne on this. And I actually have a copy of that program because I was against such a program being delivered because it was targeting 12,500 detainees who were considered insurgents um, following the 2003 invasion um, into Iraq by the US and its allied forces. The problem I had with that is that those 12,500 were not all extremist insurgents. Some were genuinely fighting to defend their country and could not be placed under this broad brush as extremists or radicalised individuals. Nevertheless, this manual was taken up and there was an attempt to implement it in Camp Boca. And those who were um, entrusted to implement it, as detailed in Professor Anne's book, were Shia. So there was conflict already with the fact that Shia were tasked with delivering a Sunni um, program of counter-radicalization. This program invariably failed and um, had to be scrapped. And this speaks to, once again, Western authorities attempting to involve and deliver strategies when they have little or no knowledge of the terrain on the ground. Physically speaking, ideologically speaking, um, socio-culturally speaking, you name it. Moving on now. The 17th of July saw... Eric Garner killed by NYPD police after an officer wrestled him to the ground and applied a, a deadly chokehold and video footage of that went viral and as I recount this particular event we are now in the tailwind of what's just recently happened with the the murder of George Floyd six years on again at the hands or at the knee on this occasion of the police in Minneapolis in Eric Garner's case, he complained and pleaded 11 times saying, I can't breathe, those famous words that haunt us even till today. And he was arrested over selling single cigarettes from packs without uh, stamps. Multiple, of, uh, multiple officers pinned him down and he became unconscious and was left in that state for seven minutes until the ambulance arrived. He was pronounced dead approximately one hour later. And one question that I have to ask in that case and the latest case of George Floyd is why emergency aid was not applied by the police officers who I'm sure are trained in that area to the suspect and subsequently victims on that occasion. Why was first aid not applied? in an attempt to resuscitate these individuals. On the 7th of August, a US-led coalition began airstrikes against ISIS, expanding that campaign of bombing to Syria the following month. And on the 15th of October, they launched Operation Inherent Resolve. And over the course of a year, they conducted more than 8,000 airstrikes in Iraq and Syria alone. One can only imagine the trauma that that caused for the innocent civilians in those countries, children in particular. And Western governments wonder why the process of radicalization continues with the subsequent generations. They ask the questions, why? this is taking place in those lands and we are seeing homegrown terrorism grow in our own societies. Referring to some other international events now, on the 29th of November, the former Egyptian president, Hosni Mubarak, was acquitted of all charges of corruption and the killing of 239 protesters. The judge dismissed the case on procedural grounds. Now, was that a travesty of justice? One would only say that this is the par for the course in many similar societies where justice isn't served in those instances against former presidents or very um, senior personnel 
in the government apparatus. On the 3rd of December, a grand jury decision was reached to not indict the NYPD police officers responsible for Eric Garner's death. And I want to quote an excerpt from President Obama's comments on that same day, because they ring true today in June 2020. Quoting from him, Some of you may have heard there was a decision that came out today by a grand jury not to indict police officers who had interacted with an individual, Eric Garner, in New York City, all of which was caught on videotape and speaks to the larger issues that we've been talking about now for the last week, the last month, the last year, and sadly for decades. And that is the concern on the part of too many minority communities that law enforcement is not working with them and dealing with them in a fair way, close quote. We will wait with interest now on the impending trials of those responsible for George Floyd's death to see if a similar conclusion is reached um, once all of the evidence has been proffered. But no one can disagree that literally little or nothing has changed since Eric Garner's death with a number of other videoed killings at the hands at the knee, at the feet, at the gun of police officers against black women and men. I'll draw to a conclusion now with a personal um, establishment. And that was my website, abdahatbaker.com. After encouragement and support from a number of colleagues, I launched my official website and the reason for doing this is because I wanted to ensure that the narratives that I provided were none other than my narratives that were not misconstrued, misrepresented, edited to fit a wider or altogether different narrative. My website in that year issued or delivered a few articles and reproduced some of my earlier ones from wider media and I'll just quickly mention those. And so on the 3rd of May, my first article, the government's new extremism manifesto, we're still unclear about the old one, was released. And then on the 11th of May, I republished the two Guardian articles of the, form, uh, the previous year. Um, uh, the one on young British Muslims needing support to prevent another village and the other one being about Islam's ability to empower is a magnet for black youths. On the 14th of May, my article was entitled On a Road to Nowhere. Again, I critiqued the government's strategy. And on the 19th of May, I reproduced two articles that were translated um, from scholars um, in the Middle East. One was entitled The Islamic Caliphate in Iraq and the other was The Calamity of the So-Called Caliphate of ISIS in Iraq. So six years on, my website is still um, running and has grown with the amount of content that is on there. Many of you or oh, many listeners are aware of that. And for those who are unaware, um, you are welcome to visit and look at the podcasts, look at the videos and articles that have been placed on there.